it'll make sense in just a second. Ten sec, I got ten minutes, so let me get going. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about, uh, well, fear. <laughs> fear. Fear and its ugly cousin, shame. And, uh, well, you know, a lot of these stories start off when you were younger. When I was a kid in high school, I was, I was a really rotten kid. I was a rotten student. I was uh, in the principal's office all the time. I was, uh, I failed everything. I failed math, science, English. Uh, I was also kind of heavy, and uh, and so all of the baggage that comes with kids picking on you, I mean, you have not lived until you've stood in a football locker room shower with an entire bunch of football players, and you're on the team because your dad wants to make, make a man out of you, and you're being spit on by 12 guys because you're the, they're the shower, and you're the, you're the loser who doesn't ever play a game. And, uh, and my father was just as guilty, you know, he was, uh, he gave me the same look the football players gave me, and every girl I passed in the hallway because of my weight and uh, probably my haircut. I don't know, but I was, it, was, it was one of these things where you start to feel this self-loathing and this shame, and uh, you, talk, you just try to hide all the time not, 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 to not feel the pain. You know, if you're afraid, it's fearful. And uh, my dad really thought I was a lousy guy, and so uh, when, and I, I barely graduated high school, Lousy grade. My dad was like, he said, like, I am not gonna pay for that bum to go to college. It's like, who says bum? You know, it's like, did he just call me a bum? I mean, like, this is 1941. It's like, so, so I was a bum, and I, so you know, I, you know, between between the grades, my grades, and the fact that my dad was gonna pay for college, I decided, you know, I'm just gonna go to work. So I actually ne never went to college. I just. Went to work, you know, dairy farming, teaching English in South America. I was a carpenter in the mountains for a while. And uh, one of the things, though, in high school that sort of saved me, it was my go-to place for shame. It was my go-to place for, for confidence building and where I could be alone. Instead of, you know, kids these days cut themselves and do all these crazy things, I drew. <laughs> I picked up a pencil one day when I was 14, and I started drawing. And it was the one time in my life, the only thing in my life, that I felt angered in, that I felt really good doing. And I did it mindlessly. It was a divorce from my brain. I got out of my brain, and I would just draw like a crazy guy for hours and hours in my bedroom. Nowadays, if the phone had been invented or the laptop, I would have been on Facebook instead. <laughs> but instead, I learned to trade. <laughs> you know, you know, so... So, but by the fact that I got so good at art and so good at drawing, you can go stalk me on Facebook if you want on my elbows, but the, reason, the, the fact that I got so good at it is testament to how much I felt, how often I felt bad, how often I needed to go and, and, and draw, because it made me feel good. It was the one thing I did really well. So I had this to hang on to. It was my, like, lightsaber. It was like my, it was my Harry Potter wand, you know, against... All those looks I get in from my father and from the football team and the girls and all that kind of stuff. So one day after all these jobs, and when I was 24, I decided, you know what? I was milking cows literally in Vermont, and I decided, you know, I think I'm a good enough artist that I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to try to be an artist. Just and I'm going to, I'm just going to damn the torpedoes and go, you know. And so I felt like my my the, the, power, the draw for me to want to go to New York, the, the urge to, to take that risk and risk failure was greater than the, the fear of failure. And so I decided that I was going to go do this. And I quit the farm, bought a leisure suit, and headed for New York. And uh, I I did like incredibly well. I had, like I mean I had this like incredibly great run, a meteoric rise, almost my. In the first five weeks, I became the art director of a major news organization with eight employees. And I'd never worked as an artist, and I'd never studied art. I just drew all the time. Turns out in journalism, there's this thing where you draw the news, you explain all of this stuff, like, you know, how, uh, how to throw a split finger fastball, or how Chernobyl melted down, or how somebody got shot or shot up at school. They, they, they draw all of that stuff, and they, who knew that that existed? You know, I wanted to do, like, you know, comic books. So, that, that, the success uh, I had sort of got me to sort of start thinking I was okay, that I wasn't the loser that I felt. And I wasn't stupid either, because these complicated topics, like explaining Hillary Clinton's, or I mean Bill Clinton's healthcare plan, you know, I was actually getting pretty, really into this stuff. And I, I started feeling like I'm not so stupid. And so, um, so I wound up getting, becoming the director of information graphics at AP News Associated Press with a staff of 30 people where I met my awesome wife, Dorsey, who worked in corporate communications there. And then I went on, and I got stolen by news 
Newsweek, and I worked as the director of graphics at Newsweek magazine uh, for a decade. Um, well, so I was there for a decade, but I was the director for seven years, and we covered, we covered the World Trade Center track, you know, drawing all the kinds of aircraft and the, the roots of the planes and, you know, all this stuff that people just love to visualize. So I became a visual storyteller, but mostly for realistic, real content news, not just made up science fiction stuff. I like facts and I like information. And so, the thing about the success, when you, I see sort of failure and success as sort of, it's sort of like, it's sort of like the stock market or global warming, for those of you that buy that. Um, uh. <laughs> you know, there are good days and bad days. There's successes and failures. There's ups and downs. There's hot and cold. And it's sort of like, your, if your successes are, but over a longer period of time, you're sort of on this upward, upward, upward trend of success in your career and in your personal life and in things that are important to you. And you start to forget that you're, you're a loser and you start to start healing. You start to heal. But there are these failures that happen. There are those downs. And so, so, so every so often you get the look from your colleagues in New York or wherever it was, the same look that you get from the jocks in that shower or that I got from my dad. And it, was, and it would set you back and you'd forget because you're, you're, there's an 11 year old who's driving this bus a lot. Um, just sort of shame, right? You just feel shame. And, uh, oh, God, I'm just this self-loathing person. I screwed up, and I'm just such an asshole. You know, and you go to bed that night, and you just go, bad, you know? And sometimes there's, like, Black Monday, where it's just really catastrophic failure, and it's just, it's just this opportunity for self-loathing, and it's, and, and it really can set you back. And so, so, but still the upper trend. And so finally, Michigan State University called me and said, hey, how would you like to come teach kids? And I said, oh, we have a high school activity. And they said, no problem, we need to know what you do. So I went to Michigan State, and I love teaching. I've been there nine years now. And I, but also, on the side, um, I do consulting. And it's, there, there's what, this is where I'm going to tell you one of my Black Monday stories. Um, there have been plenty of them. But this one was a particular recent one, and it was particularly awful. Um, so the problem with, with being successful is that you get complacent. You start to feel like you're not, you know, you've got this down, you're good. You know, the pencil and I as a team, you know, we were conquering New York and now Michigan, and it was so awesome. And we could do no wrong. And you get complacent and forgetful, and you forget that there's this horrible feeling that you can get from failure. And so I, this is a story where I, I, one of the consultant of my clients was the Sun Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. So, I've been down there a few times, and I've done really well and with my, my partner. And so we, uh, so, <laughs> so you get you get cocky, and you get sure of yourself. Like, yeah, this is easy, it's crazy, you know. So this time, the third time I went down, they wanted me to talk about something called GIS technology, geographic information systems, and uh, it's sort of a mapping thing, with satellites and cartography and all kind of stuff. It's how your phones work, find things. And I was terribly. I didn't know anything about that stuff, really. And I, I, but, you know, I don't want to let them down. I want to be one-stop shopping for all their visual needs. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I'm the guy. i got to go learn this. So I called a friend of ours, Kirk, over at the School of Ge Ge Geography College, who has a master PhD in cartography. And I said, I'll buy you lunch if you tell me about GIS. Because I thought it was a lay audience at the CIA. There were just people who wanted to be introduced to it. And I thought, you know, I can do this. And so I, I went to the... I went out to lunch with me at beer, and he's like going through the slideshow and the laptop, and I'm going, yeah, you know, I'm getting this. I'm totally getting this. And he says, hey, you want to use my slides? I said, yeah, I'll use your slides, you know. So I'm feeling really good, and I copied the slides, and I never thought about it again until I was 20 minutes from going on at the CIA. Forty people in the audience, super intelligent people, um, you know, super egghead economic political analysts, and uh, they're calling us in from the outside as experts who are going to help them do better at their jobs, you know. And uh, I'm trying to get them to do things honestly and all those kinds of things. And so I look at slides as I'm just about to go on. And I say, yeah, I got this. I got this. And uh, it's good. It's good, you know. Forgetting that failure was a reality in my life. Forgetting the fear that was has been buried by so, so many successes that I had. And then... So 20 minutes into my talk, you know, I'm, I'm doing just what I'm doing right now, and I'm talking to these guys, and all of a sudden the hand goes up, up up front, and I said, uh, uh, and I looked at the guy, and he had the look my dad has. He's sitting there looking at me like my dad, and I thought, oh shit, yes, 
question up front, and I had no idea what he was going to say. And he, he says, you know, everything you said, everything, is completely wrong. And I didn't know what to say, and I looked around the room, and everybody looked like my dad. Everybody had that shaking head, complete disappointment, loser, why are we here listening to this guy, we're busy, he doesn't know anything. And I was like, you know, just, I didn't know what to say. So I stood there, and all I could hear was the hum of the projector. And I said to the guy, I decided honesty was the best policy, and what I wanted to do was cry. I just wanted to cry. I just wanted to just, I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach and I was going to throw up and I just wanted to go hide in that corner over there. And I looked over at my partner and he was like, so I looked at the guy and I said, you know, you know you're, you're entirely right. I don't know what I'm talking about here. And uh, I said, I thought you were a lay audience. It turned out there were eight PhDs in cartography. And I said, I, I thought you were a lay audience here and I, 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 I didn't prepare enough and I, you know, if you, the, 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 the key way to fail is to not prepare and to just get all too sure. And I looked over, um, uh, I pointed, you know, I said, I, I, even the slideshow I'm showing, I, you know, I took a friend out to lunch and he told me what to say and he was a PhD cartographer and he told me, I'm even using his slides. And they just looked at me like, you know, what else can you do? Like, tell the truth, right? So, um, so I said, you know what? We've had a great morning. Uh, this is about 20 minutes. Um, but why don't we just sort of move on and do, we'll continue talking about all the stuff I do know. And uh, let's just move on. I didn't say, let's pretend this never happened, which is what I wanted to do. And I just wanted to go home and never return. And uh, I, 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 so they took a break. And, uh, and uh, after the break, most of them came back, but there were about 10 missing. 10 of them didn't come back. I got lost in my, I, uh, uh, I, you know, and it, and, and it set me back a long time because of the, you know, the healing that I've done was just, and uh, so anyway, that was, uh, the good news is they did it by hand, so, so, uh, so anyway, that's my story, folks, um, I don't know what you get from that, I don't have a great, like, cool ending, but, but that's, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's just good for me to know that I, that I, uh, if I die, my idea, my definition of success is to die thinking I'm a pretty good guy and not this self thing. And uh, that I'm not going to have that fear. Fearless. I'd like to die fearless. So that's, that's my story. So.